it's a stroke month, and this month is a cardiovascular month, right? Okay. Well, good, because I wanted to talk today about uh, post-stroke depression. Yeah, let me see how it, how it looks. Sure. Am I blocking anyone's view? Okay, well, let me get set up here. Well, I wanted to talk today about uh, post stroke depression. I think it's good timing that, uh, considering the subject matter that we've had the last two months, uh, because I think uh, vascular disease plays an important role in. Uh, and depression in the elderly. Uh, so let me just say that um, I, I guess I, all of you are interested in geriatrics in some way. I don't know what all of you, I saw some of your name tags, uh, nurses, I don't know, we have physicians, physicians, uh, assistants, uh, administrators, so forth. Okay, all right, I want to know who I'm addressing today. Uh, but uh, stroke, and, uh, stroke and depression and stroke is a pretty broad area, so I'd like to cover a very uh, a, a wide variety of things, but focus a little bit on uh, uh, the, the role that vas vascular disease uh, plays in uh, depression. So let me, with that in mind, talk about what the goals of today's presentation are. Um, by the end of the presentation, I'd like for you all to know what uh, depression looks like in the stroke population. That it doesn't just have one face, but there's uh, different syndromes that can develop. And I'd like for you to have an appreciation for that by the time you leave. I'd like for you also to have some idea of, of what the current thinking is on what causes uh, depression in stroke patients. And then have uh, some rationale for why it's important to treat it, and then uh, what some of the treatments available are uh, for patients who have strokes. So the main depressive syndromes, and I use that term broadly, and that's why I have it in quotation marks there. Uh, uh, most, most of you are probably aware of what major depression is, and that's a very uh, defined uh, syndrome that has specific criteria um, that's in a manual, and everybody knows what you mean when you say major depression, but there's uh, other depressive disorders, too, that can arise. You've probably heard of dysthymia, adjustment disorder, minor depressions, and so forth. Uh, so I've sort of grouped those as the other depressive disorders. And then there's also a couple of other uh, syndromes that are very common in, in stroke patients uh, that are not depression per se, but can sometimes uh, confuse you, and they look similar to it. One of those is, is mood lability, and uh, I don't know if anybody knows what that is or seen that before. Um, it has something, uh, it's kind of hard for me to imitate, but it looks a little bit like you'll be talking to a patient, and then they'll be talking back to you, and suddenly they'll get around like this, and then they crying, but they could be talking about sort of uh, neutral subject matter. It doesn't necessarily go along with them feeling uh, sad at the time. They can even uh, report to you that they don't particularly feel sad while they have tears streaming down their face and they have this uh, anguished look on their faces. Uh, so that's mood lability. And uh, uh, then I'd also like to talk about apathy because patients who have strokes are, are at high risk of uh, uh, presenting apathetic looking and it's uh, tempting to label them also as depressed. So I'd like to, for you to know a little bit more about that, too. Anyway, uh, as something of a reference point, I'd like for, uh, to quickly go over what we mean when we say major depression, uh, because all the other syndromes are sort of measured against that. So just quickly, I'll say that uh, major depression is a, a syndrome of uh, uh, symptoms that occur for two weeks or more and that are there nearly all the time for those two weeks or longer. It can go on for many months, even. But uh, it's, it's characterized by depressed mood, feelings of sadness, feeling down in the dumps blue, or anhedonia, which if you're not familiar with that term, that means a decreased ability to experience pleasure. Or pleasurable activities are no longer pleasurable. And it's often associated with a, a disturbance in sleep and an appetite. It's associated with a decrease in concentration, activity level, and energy.
And uh, characteristically, it has subjective qualities. It uh, has to do with a person's uh, a sense of self-worth, self-esteem. Um, uh, they often have guilt feelings, feelings of worthlessness, self-deprecating thoughts, and the like. And they might feel very hopeless, uh, feel that uh, there's not much for them in the future at all. And also, as you probably know, many of the patients who have major depression have uh, suicidal thoughts or psychotic symptoms, like hallucinations or delusions. So the question has, ar has arisen as to, is there a specific uh, disorder uh, that's uh, unique to stroke patients that uh, looks somehow clinically different than this major depression that we were talking about already? And basically, let me catch up to my notes here. I've been kind of winging it. Um, basically, a study was done in, in, the, in the 1980s, 1986, so that, was, uh, that looked at this question, and they found that uh, major depression in stroke patients looks identical to major depression in, in other populations. So if you go by the same criteria, um, th there's no in ad additional symptoms that uh, help you distinguish it clinically. And so it's, a, it's not felt to be a unique or new or distinct syndrome other than the, the usual major depression. Okay, so let me talk about these other depressive disorders that I briefly mentioned before. Some of you may know about these already. Uh, let me just define them briefly for you. They also have specific criteria, but I'm not going to go into too much detail about that. Uh, dysthymia is basically a chronic low-grade depression that goes on and on, and uh, um, to, but to a less uh, severe extent than major depression. Adjustment disorder is depression that arises in the context of an ongoing uh, social stressor or a crisis. And uh, by definition, uh, less, less than six months. Uh, minor depressions, uh, because we've labeled uh, this, uh, this other syndrome as major depression, there's some people who refer to an, uh, a lesser um, uh, depressions as minor depression. So if you have a major depression, you must have a minor depression too. So there's a literature on that, uh, but that's not official DSM-4 uh, uh, diagnostic nomenclature. And uh, finally, there's uh, substance-induced mood disorders. Persons who abuse alcohol or drugs are prone to developing a, a depressive uh, disorder that looks also uh, very much like a major depressive disorder, but remits once the substances are discontinued. Okay. So those uh, should be kept in mind, too, when you're uh, seeing your patients with stroke. Now, I talked a little bit already about uh, what uh, mood liability is. I don't know if anybody here has seen it in clinically. Anybody seen that with patients? I don't know if anybody works with stroke patients much. Okay. Um, it's pretty prominent. Once you see it, you probably won't forget it. So it's just so dramatically striking. Like I said before, it, um, it's uh, characterized by sudden, brief, intense changes in, in affect, not necessarily mood, but in affect. It's uh, usually cheerfulness, but it can be anger too and other uh, expressed emotions. Has other names. Uh, some of the literature calls it pathological crying, emotionalism, or um, catastrophic reactions. And uh, um, sort of reminds me clinically uh, of the old uh, um, Oliver and Hardy movies. When uh, I can't remember which one is which, but the, the fat one would sort of pick on the, the thin one, and he'd kind of get weepy eyed. It kind of looks like that, kind of sudden onset, and it goes away just as suddenly. And in between periods, they look kind of okay. So you might keep that in mind when we're talking about this. It looks a little bit like that. If you take care of stroke patients, you'll see it. Okay. I also talked about earlier about um, patients who present apathetically. And uh, basically, apathy is when a person has a very impoverished behavior or speech, uh, decreased activity. They just sit around. They need uh, lots of uh, prompting uh, by their caregivers. You know, need to be told when it's time to eat, when it's uh, time to dress, when they don't ask to go outside of the house, they sit around on the couch or they sit around in their room. And they usually don't give nurses much of a problem because they just kind of sit around and wait to be led. Um, but other caregivers, they give a lot of problems too because uh, if you're trying to live independently, uh, you're, everyone's expected to kind of carry their own load, uh, do things without being prompted and reminded. So they're, they're very difficult. Uh, cases when someone's uh, apathetic. Um, but what I want to emphasize is that apathy, even though it's found in, in major depression, it's not the same as depression. That apathy is, is simply a, a sign that you see uh, 
in uh, patients that have a variety of different conditions. Some of them can be general medical conditions, and it's usually associated with what we call a subcortical dementia, an apathetic dementia, the dementias that are not like Alzheimer's disease, because as you probably know if any of you work with Alzheimer's patients, they're usually quite active, and uh, apathy is not one of the problems that they have, although they can also become apathetic. And the way you uh, distinguish uh, apathy from major depression is, is clinically is by the absence of the subjective symptoms of depression. They don't feel guilty, worthless, they don't have self-deprecating thoughts. Um, even though they may look terribly depressed because they don't do anything, they don't have much of an expression at all. That's one way you can distinguish that clinically. Okay, so I've defined some of these syndromes for you. Does anybody have any questions before I go on? All right, well, let's talk a little bit about the epidemiology of uh, depression. And uh, uh, in the general community population, this is data incidentally is from the epidemiologic catchment area study from the 1980s. Um, in the general community, uh, major depression affects about 4% of the adult population at any time. And uh, interestingly, it only affects about 1% of the elderly population in the general community. And uh, nobody really knows why uh, that's uh, uh, that's so strikingly different. Uh, they don't know if it's a, a cohort effect that maybe the elderly are not as prone to depression as younger adult populations, or what it is exactly. I guess we probably won't know until the younger adults actually move on and become elderly. But uh, if you go by strict major depressive criteria, it's uh, less common than in, in younger adult populations. That's in the general community. Uh, there's other studies that uh, look at depression defined more broadly, uh, including some of the minor depressions, uh, dysthymia and so forth. And in the elderly, you can see here, if you look at it that way, it's much more common. About 20 to 25% of the general population has some clinically significant depression that doesn't meet full criteria for major depression necessarily. Um, but if you, if you see here, as you go down uh, in primary care clinics, then inpatient medical units and institutional settings, uh, the, the, uh, it's much more common. Um, so as the sort of disease burden, the number of uh, medical illnesses that a person has increases, so does the incidence of depression. Okay. So why is it that uh, these patients who have a, a, such a high level of uh, general medical problems have so much more depression? Well, if you, if you think about uh, who's uh, in those populations, uh, uh, the, the people with the greatest disease burden often, in our society at least, have a lot of vascular disease. People on inpatient medical units have, are there generally for vascular problems related to their kidneys, their hearts, uh, strokes, and so forth, and certainly in institutionalized settings, that's a very common uh, problem. But in, in patients with known strokes, and when I say uh, patients who have known strokes, I mean the people who have uh, uh, objective uh, deficit on physical examination or some symptoms uh, that are consistent with a stroke. They know they have a stroke. Uh, the incidence of depression is between uh, about 26% uh, and 61%. And so the question is, well, why, do they, why is it so high in that population? It's higher than the, the, the general uh, population, and uh, why is that? Well, the uh, traditional view about that has been that, uh, well, it's a reaction to having a very serious illness, that uh, wouldn't you be depressed if suddenly you couldn't uh, move half of your body, that maybe you couldn't drive, you couldn't walk, uh, you couldn't control your bowels or bladder, and it makes sense, wouldn't you be depressed? And that's probably a part of it. Um, but there's also some evidence now that suggests that maybe uh, the depressive symptoms that are experienced uh, are due to the, uh, the, the vascular lesions themselves. So let's talk a little bit about that. I got this from one of the articles that I have referenced there in your... Uh, and outs. And it's uh, simply a diagram of what uh, etiologic factors might uh, contribute to uh, depression in, in uh, stroke patients and, and actually late life uh, depression with vascular uh, problems. And as you can see there, there's risk factors for uh, vascular lesions like hypertension, coronary artery disease that uh, may eventually cause uh, frontal lobe and basal ganglia lesions, which may um, put someone to um, as more vulnerable to depression, as well as genetic factors that play a role, social factors, and negative life events, and so forth, that all come together and, and cause a depressive disorder. 
in the last 15 years or so, there's been a great advance, as you know, in, in the uh, technology, and we're able to image people's brains uh, like never before. And um, what we've learned from the studies is that there's really little association between the amount of impairment that a person experiences from a stroke and the severity of a person's depression. Um, uh, numerous studies have shown that. Uh, so uh, uh, the, the overriding uh, thinking about it now is that the difference between those, uh, remember the slide I showed you, showed you before that showed the, the incidence between being between 26 and 60 percent roughly? Uh, the, 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 uh, the part that uh, determines whether or not you're depressed probably has more to do with the, uh, the location and the severity of the vascular lesions actually in the brain. That's what uh, the current thinking is. Um, let's see. Uh, now they've uh, attempted to define which part of the brain causes depression. You know, if you could uh, uh, define that, that would help uh, strengthen the argument a great deal that uh, if there was a part of the brain that was uh, specifically associated with depression and you get a stroke there and every time a person gets depressed, it would be a pretty uh, a neat trick to, to show. But uh, they haven't been able to do that as of yet. There, uh, a few years ago it was uh, commonly uh, reported that uh, left frontal lesions would be associated with depression. But there's uh, other articles that uh, refute that uh, and it's not really known exactly where the, the lesions are that cause depression. But uh, um, more often than not, they affect uh, the frontal lobes, the basal ganglia, and the, the white matter tracts that go around the ventricles inside the brain, which are called uh, 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 white matter lesions when they occur there. Okay. Okay, so uh, we've talked about uh, patients who have known strokes and who have imaging studies, and uh, let's talk a little bit about people who uh, elderly folks who do not have any uh, known stroke. These are people who don't have uh, motor or sensory deficits by uh, history or by examination. What do these depressed elderly folks who don't have any history of stroke look like? Well, there's a literature on this too. Uh, uh, the Japanese uh, uh, have uh, uh, done studies on this uh, looking at uh, young patients uh, sort of uh, middle-aged adults, say between the age of 50 and 65, who are depressed, and uh, elderly, older than 65, and have looked at their MRIs. And these are patients without any, uh, again, without any known strokes. And uh, what they found is that uh, about 94% uh, uh, of the patients over 65 have these silent cerebral infarctions, these places that clinically you, you wouldn't expect them to, to have any infarctions, but they do. Um, in the age group between 50 and 65, it's about half of the patients had these uh, abnormal uh, findings on MRI. And uh, this is much higher than uh, the, the, pop the, the younger adult population. So there's the, uh, the silent cerebral infarctions, as they're called. There's also other studies that show that uh, uh, pa uh, elderly patients who have uh, depression have a greater number of what are called deep white matter or periventricular white matter changes uh, on MRI than uh, age matched control patients do. And still other studies, and this last one is commonly quoted in uh, the literature. It's a study done by Ed Coffey that uh, he calculated uh, the, the uh, ratio for, uh, for cerebrovascular changes being 7 to 1. That if an elderly person who has new onset depression, if you look at their MRI, the odds are 7 to 1 that they'll have these vascular changes on MRI. All right, so what other data is there that suggests that maybe uh, depression in the elderly is associated with vascular disease? Well, there are studies that show that uh, cardiovascular disease, so not cerebrovascular disease, but cardiovascular disease is commonly found in elderly depressed patients. So we know that. There's other studies that have shown a correlation, a strong association between uh, carotid disease, carotid atherosclerosis, myocardial infarctions, and these deep white matter hyperintensities I was telling you about earlier. So there's studies that have shown the connection there. And then there's also uh, studies that have shown that in elderly onset depression, these deep white matter hyperintensities are more common than in age-matched controls and in early onset depression. So that's uh, uh, 
pretty compelling information. It may not be conclusive as of this time, but it's very compelling. But it seems that vascular disease is a major contributor to the depression in the elderly, whereas in younger populations that may not be, be as true. Incidentally, I uh, don't have a slide for this, but uh, uh, when comparing elder, uh, patients who have elderly onset depression and comparing them to patients who have always been depressed, for example, people who have had recurrent depression their whole life, you compare those two groups, the ones who have uh, 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 sort of the usual major depression is uh, young onset. So they have a strong family history of affective disorder, um, also have personality disorders, uh, adverse psychosocial circumstances, and so forth, the usual risk factors that you think of for depression. But the elderly don't have those risk factors. They don't usually have a family history of affective disorder. They don't have a personal history of affective disorder. But they do have a higher, higher family history of hypertension, which, of course, is a risk factor for vascular disease. So that's another piece that needs to be considered. Anyway, so why should we treat depression in the stroke patient? Well, as you probably know from, from uh, uh, your own experience, uh, major depression is an extremely dis disabling condition. It affects uh, very many aspects of a person's life. Um, they require increased caregiver, uh, caregiving uh, by the, those around them, and uh, uh, it's been compared uh, to other severe medical problems, and it ranks up there as, as one of the most uh, disabling conditions, and it causes a lot of suffering. For, so for that reason, if no other, it's, it's worth treating. Also, uh, the rehab uh, literature is filled with uh, uh, comparisons of uh, patients who have depression versus patients who don't have depression, and how well they do in uh, physical rehab. And the studies generally show that uh, the depressed patients do worse. Um, given what we know about vascular disease being associated with depression, we don't really know if that's because they have a greater lesion burden or if there's something about being depressed that makes it hard for them to, to rehab, but there's, there is an association there. And uh, also, uh, major depression itself, uh, regardless of uh, uh, anything else, can cause a cognitive impairment that's potentially reversible with treatment. So if you can do something to reverse the person's cognitive uh, impairment, that will help the patient and help those around them, their caregivers. So what are the available options in treating a person with depression? Well, um, this question is only well studied and well answerable in younger, healthy adult populations. Uh, and in those populations, the usual way it's approached is, as I've listed here, um, psychotherapy, the so-called talking therapies. There's medications, antidepressants. There's electroconvulsive therapy, which uh, probably isn't as used as much as it should be used. It's still uh, the most efficacious treatment we have for depression. It uh, is, uh, has the quickest onset, usually within a few days. Um, and uh, nearly no matter how sick you are, you're still uh, a candidate for ECT. There's no real absolute contraindications for it. So if, uh, if you really need a rapid response if somebody's morbidly depressed, uh, this is something that you really should think of, and it would be a first-line treatment in those situations. Um, uh, but in the, in, uh, th these, are, these are treatments that are available and well-studied in, in young, healthy populations. In the stroke population, you need to also understand that uh, a fair number, maybe 25 to 50 percent of them, uh, the depression remits spontaneously if you do nothing over a period of three to six months. So in some cases, you may not want to do something. But uh, these are the treatments that we have available for major depression. And in general, major depression is major depression. Wherever you see it, you ought to treat it, even if it's in the stroke patient. So the available medications, which would likely be effective, are are these, you may be already familiar with these, I'll just list a few so you have some examples. Tricyclic antidepressants are like amitriptyline, nortriptyline, and so forth. Monoamine oxidase inhibitors are uh, like phenylzine. Serotonin-specific reuptake inhibitors are like Prozac and Zoloft and Luvox and Paxil, and there may be a new one that might have come out recently. Also, atypical agents like Welbutrin or Venlafaxine or Serzone, or, uh, which is nifazidone or trazodone. And then uh, there's some uh, uh, literature that supports uh, use, the use of stimulants uh, for patients who are depressed. Okay, uh, let me go a little bit more about these medications. 
the, ant the tricyclic antidepressants and the monoamine oxidase inhibitors are the, the older uh, antidepressants that have been available, and they're pretty difficult for the elderly po folks to take because they have a lot of side effects. Um, so uh, even though it's not yet well studied, uh, most uh, clinicians will use uh, SSRIs pre pretty liberally with uh, the elderly patient population because they're much uh, uh, more well tolerated. And uh, unlike tricyclic antidepressants, which are notorious for causing orthostatic hypotension and can, can lead to a, yeah, right, uh, uh, falls, hip fractures, which are uh, 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 extremely uh, deadly in some cases. Uh, these SSRIs are, are easier for people to take, as are many of the atypical agents. All right. When using antidepressant medications, you need to give the patient at least a month on a therapeutic dose to know if the, the medication is going to help or not. Um, some people have the expectation that taking the medication for a couple of days will make a difference, but it usually takes a month or six weeks even before you know what the maximum effect will be. So give it enough time as long as you have a reasonable dose. Also in uh, the stroke population, the, uh, the thinking is that maybe these patients are more refractory to treatment. So you may have to try more than one agent or higher doses than you would in other populations and, and that's basically harder to treat. And then once the, the, the disorder is treated, it may need to be treated for a longer period of time than you would otherwise do it. Okay, so th th those are the treatments for major depressive disorder. Let me talk a little bit about the other depressive disorders. I said that there's, uh, it's not very well studied in the elderly uh, patient population how to treat major depression in the stroke population. Uh, for these other depressive disorder orders, the data is even less. So uh, in treating these patients, you need to consider what the, the risk to benefit ratio is of uh, of how severely depressed the person is, how immediate it is that they need to be treated, and how risky the treatment you're going to employ is. And again, since the medications are pretty safe now, unless you have a real strong reason not to, uh, if you suspect depression, it's probably best to treat it, because if uh, it responds, you're doing a great service to your patient and those around your patient. Okay. And I talked to you already a couple of times about mood lability. And then there's also a small body of literature on this subject, uh, but there is some. And uh, let me tell you about a, a, a case that I had about uh, maybe six months ago now. There's a, I think it's about 66-year-old uh, Anglo male who was admitted to my inpatient uh, psychiatry unit who'd had a stroke about uh, nine months ago, I believe. And he'd already gone through rehab and he was able to walk with a cane. It was doing pretty good, but he had this. Uh, pronounced mood lability like I described before. He'd start crying about neutral subjects while he's talking to you and then abruptly stop and then come back later. And just almost every conversation you had with him, it was like that, just profound. Um, uh, we decided to try him on a trial of SSRI, uh, Zoloft specifically, and within two days it was completely gone. I mean, he didn't have that problem at all. Uh, you could talk to him and he wouldn't tear up, he wouldn't, uh, uh, you know, have the, uh, the painful affect or any of those things. And uh, um, and that was a, a, a quite a, a prominent thing to see. And uh, so uh, in my experience, it, uh, it does well with SSRIs, and it often responds rapidly. I saw an article in the European literature where they use an SSRI that we don't have here, but I assume the principle ought to be the same. And they report the same thing. They did a controlled study of maybe uh, 13 patients in each group. Uh, the placebo patients, almost none of them did better. And in the uh, control, the, the medication group, they almost all did well, uh, having much better than a 50% uh, uh, improvement. And, and they also reported that the improvement was in, within three days. So this may be something that's different than major depression, something that you can treat right away and not have to wait a month or longer. So I don't know why that is, but it's interesting that one would be treated faster. So keep that in mind. If you see that, it might help. OK talked also already about apathy. Treatment for apathy is first to review your workup to make sure you're not missing some general medical condition that could be treatable and ultimately reversible. And that's the first order of business. And uh, beyond that, uh, apathy as a diagnosis itself isn't uh, written about all that much. There is a small body of literature about it. But uh, there is something that I, th I can say about this, that uh, 
there's a pretty large volume of, of literature on the use of stimulant medications like methylphenidate or Ritalin. And uh, these medications are most commonly used in adults in general medical situations like in ICUs and uh, cancer patients and so forth, people who are really extremely sick. And uh, if you reflect on your experience with these patients, most of them are pretty darn apathetic too. They just lay around and they look depressed and, and the treatment team responds to them looking so depressed and being so apathetic. And I think the reason that uh, this is written about so, so often in case reports and small series is because uh, patients respond so dramatically sometimes uh, to these stimulants. So that's something to keep in mind, that uh, stimulant medications like Ritalin or methylphenidate, uh, pemoline, dextroamphetamine might be a helpful agent to employ for your apathetic patients once you've worked them up for other causes. Okay. The last thing I wanted to talk about today was uh, uh, in some of these articles and in most recently I saw an article from March 1996 from the Archives of Internal Medicine that talked about the idea that maybe depression in the elderly is uh, sometimes the first sign of vascular disease. That even before a person has angina, TIAs, or any of those symptoms, that maybe the very first uh, sign uh, sometimes is uh, a new onset depression or a worsening of a depression in an elderly patient. Uh, so if that's true, it may be uh, that not only should you treat the patient with an antidepressant, but also prescribe aspirin or some other prophylactic uh, treatment uh, to prevent uh, you know, the, uh, upcoming heart disease or uh, strokes. And if that's the case, maybe uh, it would be called a, a pre-stroke depression. I don't know. It's, uh, Well, in summary then, we talked a little bit about the different depressive syndromes and depressive-like syndromes that occur in the stroke population. That there's a major depression, these sort of non-major depression depressions. There's mood lability and there's apathy. And some of them are treated with antidepressants and others are not. Uh, that uh, there seems to be a fairly strong uh, link between vascular disease and uh, depression, and it may in fact be uh, a contributing factor, a major contributing factor to depression in the elderly. That treatment is indeed important, important, and we've talked about what some of the treatments are. I don't have anything else to say. <coughs> Do you all have any questions for me? Yes. Uh, you mentioned that there aren't really any contraindications for ECT. Well, it, it, it's kind of a complicated issue because, for one thing, uh, the person's cognitive impairment may be due to the depression. So, in, in some cases, we would uh, give uh, ECT because of the cognitive impairment. But not a pseudo dementia. Uh, okay. but, but somebody who is, in fact. Yeah, someone who's like a, a demented person uh, who already has cognitive impairment, like an Alzheimer's patient. Uh, um, but the interesting thing about Alzheimer's disease is that they hardly ever get depressed. Incidence is like much lower than 1% if they have just pure Alzheimer's disease. So that situation may not arise that much. Um, but there's other, uh, you know, a delirium probably wouldn't be the best time to use ECT. Um, although I think uh, there's some literature that says it's effective for it. Nobody really knows why ECT works so well. I do, actually. Yeah, actually, I do. I'm at the VA on an inpatient service. So at the VA, I never see Alzheimer's disease. I saw it when I was a fellow in training, but I'd never see it at the VA. And does any of you work at the VA or work through a VA ever? Okay. Uh, as you probably know, the VA is a hotbed for vascular disease, though. I mean, everybody has vascular disease at the VA. They smoke, they have uncontrolled hypertension, hypercholesterolemia, uh, you know, they have a lifetime of hard living, usually. So uh, what I see in my populations is almost uh, invariably when we get an MRI uh, for uh, someone who's depressed and, and elderly, even not so elderly sometimes, so they have these same uh, changes on MRI. So in my experience is, is that that's true, but it's not a very controlled situation because I don't see uh, healthy elderly and I don't see uh, other patient populations that don't have such vascular risk factors. So.
hard for me to study that well where I'm at. So do you routinely order an MRI for, for a new onset depression? For an elderly person, I do. Yeah, for an elderly person, I do. Not, not a, a young, healthy adult, especially if the person doesn't have any atypical factors. That, that wouldn't be the usual standard. Somebody who's post-stroke, do you ever see or do they ever get diagnosis of bipolar at that time? I've never seen that myself, frankly, but uh, it is reported. There's a pretty uh, robust literature on that, that, that it, can, it can cause manic symptoms. And I didn't really look into that in the literature to, to tell you all about that today, but uh, perhaps I, I should have. Yeah, it does happen. Yes. Yeah. Uh, they used to say that the, the left frontal lesions would cause, cause depression and the right frontal ones would cause mania. But I think that's much too uh, overly simplified. Mm -hmm.